Today's scripture reading is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 to 31. Now, when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negeb and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam and Jezreel, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? He answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. So David set out, and the six hundred men who were with him, and they came to the brook Besor, where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and four hundred men. Two hundred stayed behind, who were too exhausted to cross the brook Besor. They found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David, and they gave him bread and he ate. They gave him water to drink, and they gave him a piece of cake, gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit revived, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. And David said to him, To whom do you belong? And where are you from? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. We had made a raid against the Negeb of the Cherethites and against that which belongs to Judah and against the Negeb of Caleb, and we buried Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Will you take me down to this band? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this band. And when he had taken him down, behold, they were spread abroad all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing, because all the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken, David brought back all. David also captured all the flocks and herds and the people drove the livestock before him and said, this is David's spoil. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David and who had been left at the brook Besor. And they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children and depart. But David said, You shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hands the band that came against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. And he made it a statute and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. When David came to Ziklag, he sent part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, 
Here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. It was for those in Bethel, in Ramoth, of the Negeb in Jatir, in Eroe, in Sifmoth, in Eshtemoa, in Rachel, in the cities of Jeharumalites, in the cities of the Kenites, in Horma, in Borashan, in Athak, in Hebron, for all the places where David and his men had roamed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, and <clears throat> we're continuing on with our reflection on 1 Samuel. And today we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 30, when you are greatly distressed. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we come before you this morning. Thank you. Thanking you again for Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Thank you for the peace that he has wrought in our lives. As through Jesus Christ, we will reconcile to you. We can make peace with you, Lord. Father, this morning, as we look into your word, we ask that may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, that they'll be acceptable to you, our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. When you're greatly distressed, I think we all have different kinds of distress in our life. And if you look at the story that we just read in 1 Samuel chapter 30, uh, not only David, but his men were greatly distressed. They, was, they were distressed because the Amalekites have attacked Ziklag. They've taken their wives, their sons, their daughters, plunder, everything taken. And they cried so bad until they don't have any more strength left. You can understand why 200 were so exhausted they could not continue on the journey for the rest of the battle. Not only that, I think David was also greatly distressed because in verse 6, we read of the threat of being stoned because his men were very angry with him. I mean... This is our leader who's supposed to figure everything for us, but now we are in trouble. We have lost our families. We lost our plunder. And they were thinking of stoning him. So if you like the stress that David and his men were going through, a lot of it was emotional stress. Emotional stress from loss of family, loss of property. There was probably fear, the stress of fear. Uh, so what now? Where do we go on now? You know, that kind of thing. Perhaps the stress of insecurity as well. And, you know, our leader David kind of figured out how we can be protected. And we read that in chapter 27, how David figured out a strategic plan, if you like, that they can feel safe in the city or in the territory of the Philistines. And yet, you look at chapter 29, again, you know, it's like as though you felt safe enough and now the Philistine uh, Akish is asking them to go out to war and fight with him, that kind of thing. And of course, there was no peace. No, no peace because in this chapter, we read of an old enemy of Israel, the Amalekites. And this morning, we want to understand a bit of this old enemy, Amalekites, and what that means for Israel, and perhaps what that means for us today as well. Who are the Amalekites? The Amalekites are the descendants of Amalek. Amalek is the grandson of Esau. Now, you know the story of Esau and Jacob, the twins, and how he sold his birthright, how Esau sold his birthright for a pot of stew. And not only that, uh, we will read about how Esau swore 
to kill his brother in Genesis chapter 27, verse 41. And so down through history, ever since the episode of Esau and Jacob, we see generation after generation after generation of Malachites targeting Israel, targeting the Jews. And the atrocities of the Amalekites include killing for plunder. And sometimes they just kill because they want the clothes of the people. Killing children, even human sacrifices. And these atrocities are centered on historical envy and bitterness that started with Esau, generation after generation. And as you look at Old Testament history, we're not just talking about Amalekites, but we're talking about the spirit of Amalek, the spirit of envy and bitterness, the spirit of revenge that generation after generation, they seek to destroy the Jews. They are unlike the other enemies of Israel, like Babylon or, or, uh, or Egypt and all that, but the, the Amalek, the spirit of Amalek, decides to destroy everything Everything that's Jewish. So we see the first part of it, uh, how God intervened in that uh, envy and bitterness when they are about to meet each other. And Esau comes out to so-called greet Jacob with 300 fighting men. And of course, you think about it, your brother coming against you with 300 fighting men, you are terrified. And of course, Jacob was terrified. He was concerned about the women and the children and all that. But God intervened and brought about a reconciliation between Esau and Jacob in that remarkable uh, episode. And that marked the entry of Jacob back into the promised land. God appeared to him, changed his name to Israel. Then you have the second episode where the Am Am Amalekites appeared again, or the spirit of Amalek to destroy the Jews again, is when uh, they, were going, they were going out of Egypt and you, the Amalekites were would kind of hassle them, would attack the weak ones, the children and the women who were straggling behind, and then finally the war at Rephidim. Uh, we probably don't remember the war at Rephidim, but what we remember about it is Moses up in the mountain raising his hands in intercession, and Aaron and her there holding up his hands, and as long as his hands were raised in intercession, Israel had the upper hand in the battle. And when his hands grew tired and came down, the Amaleks uh, would have the upper hand. And in that war, God granted them a great victory. The third time you see the spirit of Amalek in operation is this chapter that we read in 1 Samuel chapter 30. David and his men, having lost Ziklag, burnt everything. Wives, sons, daughters, all taken, plunder, all taken. And, of course, God led them to a victory. And this was significant because with this event, in the next one to two years, David became the next king of Israel. The fourth time Amalek, the spirit of Amalek raised his head was in the book of Esther. Those of you who are familiar with the book of Esther, and Haman uh, had a plan to destroy, to kill all the Jews, just like the Amalekites kill all the Jews, and Haman was a descendant of Amalek as well. And God divinely intervened through Esther, a Jew as well, and finally the whole uh, tables were turned against uh, Haman and his gang. And thank God for that because there was a special crossroad in the lives of the, the Israelites and the Jews because if that had happened, if the extermination of the Jews had happened uh, in Persia, you would not have Nehemiah rebuilding the walls, and you wouldn't have Ezra who taught the people again the word of the Lord. That's in the Old Testament. And the spirit of Amalek uh, roots itself in what happened in Esau and uh, in Amalek and all that. So we call it the spirit of Amalek, and commentators will say that not only uh, Amalekites had that spirit of Amalek, which is actually a spirit of white, we call it violent anti-Semitism, violent anti-Semitism, that today it has also affected different groups of people. And we see the spirit of Amalek today, 
historically in the, the Nazi, the Third Reich, and the killing of six million Jews in the Holocaust. A lot of us are familiar with the story. The intent to wipe up the Jews under Hitler. Of course, today the most recent will be Hamas and the war on Israel. I'm not going to discuss on who is right or who is wrong, but Hamas reflects so much on the spirit of Amalek. The picture you see there is a, a picture from, if you know the name, Kibbutz Be'eri, one of the farming communities that was destroyed. Interestingly, the kibbutz that were attacked is at the same site as what you read in 1 Samuel chapter 30, Ziklag. So Hamas has a charter. Hamas has a charter to annihilate every Jew on earth. In fact, in their tradition, they quote from the Hadith that the, that the, 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 end, the end of time or, or the final uh, closing of history uh, would need to have all the Jews destroyed. And in fact, they will say that that uh, you know you come to a point where the uh, where the killing of the Jews will be so extreme and everyone kill that uh, whenever there's a Jew spotted they will say oh come there is a Jew behind me kill him that's the Hamas charter and we see the spirit of Amalek throughout history every time something comes out on that uh, Israel is at a crossroad God is going to do something right something significant and so some commentators have been discussing this, that, that what we see today in the war in Israel and what happened on October 7th, is Israel at a crossroad or something? Is God going to do something there? And we don't know yet. And Jesus has reminded us again and again to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we need to continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm not saying who is right, who is wrong. But we need to pray for the peace of or Jerusalem. We are living in a world where there is great distress globally. I think we are also living lives where there are great distress in our individual lives, in our little communities and all that. And as I was reflecting on this and what is happening in the world today, I think we can be involved in praying for Jerusalem, for the peace of Jerusalem. That's the center of attention that is the the, if you like the, the compass or the, the clock, they will tell us what's going to happen next and when Jesus Christ is coming back again, which is so very soon now. But I'm reminded of the hymn that we have in our Methodist hymn, our hymn number 431, I believe. Let there be peace on earth. And I'd like us to sing that song this morning as our corporate prayer uh, to God that there will be peace. Yeah. Hey. 
greatly distressed. Let's remember to pray for the peace of Jerusalem when we are in global distress. But when we are personally also greatly distressed like David and his men, I think there are three things that we need to be reminded from this story. One is that we must find strength in God. Second is we must actively seek God. And thirdly, we must consider the people of God. I think 1 Samuel chapter 30 is a remarkable story of a story from tragedy to triumph. And especially this season of, of Advent, when we reflect on the coming of the Prince of Peace, the first coming, Oshie Leader told us about the second coming as well, the Prince of Peace. Let us seek Him, because he can, only He can restore lasting peace in our lives in this world. The first one, find strength in God. We see David here seeing God's grace with the Philistines and the Amalekites as well. We see God determine or deliver David from foolish wisdom that you find in 1 Samuel chapter 27. Human wisdom, human strategy, and God delivered. He, he, would have, he would have had to fight with the Philistines against his own people. But God intervened and the commanders of the Philistine army said, no, we should not have this fellow fighting with us. What if he turned against us? So he was sent back. It was God's deliverance from, for him to be in that, that uh, uh, situation, that, that dilemma, you know, should I fight my own people or should I not fight my own people? Not only that, God protected the Israelites from the full wrath of the Amalekites. You know the history of the Amalekites. It's amazing. It's amazing in verse 2 where it says, they killed none of them. Very unlike the Amalekites. They killed none of them. And really, this is God's intervention. And so to be able to see God's grace in how David was delivered from the Philistines as well as the Amalekites. And of course, to look to God also in the face of internal opposition. His men wanted to stone him. It does not tell us exactly why they changed their mind. But as verse 6 says that uh, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him, each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. And then the next phrase immediately, but contrast. David found strength in the Lord his God. Perhaps the men were thinking, yeah, you are a great leader. You thought all this out. We thought we got a good solution. We'll be safe from the Philistines. And then they saw some change in him, perhaps. Perhaps they saw David, huh? Now he's not depending on his human wisdom. He's looking to God kind of thing. But David found strength in the Lord, his God. And I hope that in the midst of the kind of distress we go through, that it will be the same phrase that will describe us. But Herbert found strength in the Lord, his God. But put your name there, found strength in the Lord your God. Not only finding strength and looking to God uh, kind of thing, but to actively see God. He not, not only David recognizes he needs to trust God, but he actively seeks God and from verse 7 onwards. Now he consults the priest of God to bring the ephod. 
And so he asked the question, shall I pursue? Will I overtake? This is so different from 1 Samuel chapter 27. 1 Samuel chapter 27, he's not asking God, but here he's asking very clearly, shall I pursue? Will I overtake? And the word from God in the later part of verse 8, you will overtake and succeed in rescue. You will overtake and succeed in rescue. What a confidence and what a hope that God is giving him. You will overtake and succeed in rescue. So he's seeking God's direction. And as he seeks God's direction, God gives direction, God gives signs, and many times when we seek God, God puts a lot of things in our way to help us move along as we handle the distress. And when God does that, we have to be watchful. Seek God's signs. Open your eyes. Open the, 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 the heart and the eyes of your spirit to see, well, how is God answering that prayer of ours? And this is an interesting way how God answered uh, David's inquiry. He sent an Egyptian of all people. An Egyptian who was discarded by the Amalekites, a servant of the Amalekites, because he was sick. So they threw him three days without food and water kind of thing, very weak. And if David had not seen that as a sign from God to help him in that, uh, that whole thing about uh, overtaking and succeeding in rescue, he would have killed the Egyptian. Because by his own admission, he was involved in burning down Ziglat. He would have killed him. But God provided the Egyptian to help David <clears throat> to go down to where the people were. And David, in verse 18, he says what? David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken. Not only the wives, the sons and daughters, but also the plunder. Again, this is very amazing for the Amalekites not to have touched the plunder as well. Probably they were uh, celebrating away and uh, enjoying the plunder from the Philistines, Philistine territory first. They had not touched the ones from Ziklag yet. And they were, was able to recover everything in verse 18 that the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing, verse 19, was missing. Young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. He recovered everything as he actively sought God, you will overtake and you will succeed in your rescue. Then as God gives you success, as God brings you through the distress, remember the people of God. Remember the people of God. Those who went, those who went halfway, you know, the 200 were too tired to continue on. Should you write them off? And those who sent, those who, who weren't even in the 600 kind of thing, you know. This is like the, 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 the life team or the support team that God gives you uh, in your whole journey of distress. It was to be a celebration of God's great deliverance, deliverance or re really God's miraculous deliverance. Why? There were so many miracles. The first miracle, the Amalekites didn't kill anyone. That's a miracle. The second miracle, the Amalekites were subdued. I was trying to figure out how many, uh, how, how, how many were the people that, uh, that David was up against. What, what, what were the number of Amalekites? And uh, there is nothing mentioned of the, the, the size of the Amalekite army. But you get, some, uh, you get some hint of it because at the end when David subdued Amalek, the Amalekites, uh, everybody was killed except how many people escaped? 400. Okay. 400 escaped on camel. And that was after how long a battle? From dusk to evening the next day. That was more than 24 hours. So can you imagine how big the Amalekite army would have been to, to have a battle more than 24 hours and kill everyone, leaving 400 who would even escape and run away? And David had only 400 men who went against the Amalekites. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. 
I think the Amalekite army would have numbered thousands to even reach the end of the balance of 400 to escape. Second miracle. Third miracle. It was a 24-hour, at least 24-hour uh, battle. We read about 200 who were just too exhausted, you know, after handling all that and all the emotional trauma and stress and all that. The 200 could not go on. They were too exhausted. And here were 400 who would probably be half exhausted or something like that, who went in and fought a battle 24 hours long. I think that's a miracle to have that kind of stamina. That's the third miracle. Of course, the fourth miracle will be they recovered everything, including the plunder, plus, plus, extras, probably from the Philistine territories. You will overtake and succeed in rescue. I think it's significant that whenever God brings us out of distress, we remember the people in our lives, we remember the people in our community, and the, the people in our life team. In ministry, in missions, we also remember all those. And, and we, some of us feel that, well, if I remain behind, then you know, I am not as blessed as those who have gone on ahead. Uh, that kind of thing. But Jesus has told us, he who sends the prophet will also receive a prophet's reward. You may not be a missionary on the mission field, but if you're actively sending someone out in prayer, in finances or whatever, you will also receive the same reward that the missionary receives on the mission field. So consider the people of God as God leads you to distress. Reflection for us this morning. Who or what is your first course, recourse in your times of great distress? Why? Do we turn to Jesus first? You know, when the angels appeared to the shepherds when Christ was born, when the Prince of Peace was born, they sang a song Peace on earth, goodwill to a man. Peace on earth. And we know Jesus Christ came. He was, some people say, born to die. He went on the way to the cross of Calvary, to die on the cross of Calvary. So that today we can have peace with God. We are reconciled to God. And we need to turn to Christ as a first recourse in establishing that relationship of peace with God. Because the rest of our journey, turning to Christ again and again. To what extent are you alert to how God is with you in your distress? Do you often miss the signs? God has thrown a lot of things in our way as He journeys with us in our distress. Thirdly, who are part of your community journeying with you actively or supportively as you seek to grow towards Christ? Can we all learn to look to Christ and keep our eyes Focus on Him as we walk this journey or as we run this race. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank You that in our lives and in the history of humanity, You have intervened again and again and again and again. And so, Father, we look to You. We look to You to intervene in our lives we look to you to intervene in our human history and that your purposes on earth and in our lives will be fulfilled. Indeed, the Prince of Peace will be fully enthroned in our lives and in this world. Help us to walk that journey, keeping our eyes focused on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. We ask this in Jesus' name.